All right, y'all. So glad you tuned in to my TED Talk. Uh, just kidding. I'm so glad you've tuned in actually though to read this with me if you wanted to or if you wanted to read it alone, that's fine. But we're gonna go through this. So this is Mary Rawlinson. She's a minister's wife. She was living in Massachusetts during King Philip's War. And we'll get into that war in a little bit more detail. But if you remember in class, I was talking about um, one of my direct descendants, the shepherd having, thank you, Lord, and Deacon Ralph having um, 18 kids, 17 living to adulthood, and that some of their things occurred during King Philip's War. Well, one of those girls, Sarah Shepherd, um, had a very similar experience to Mrs. Rawlinson here. So this was a real thing that happened. Um, I don't know if y'all have seen Last of the Mohicans. Um, it follows this kind of as, as well, similar. Indians regularly stole um, women and children and men if they could from the colonial um, towns as a way of getting back at them and the, the relationships the were not very peaceful at this time. And we've talked a little bit about that. So um, let's see what her word says. So it says here that in the end, she's gonna be held captive for 11 weeks though. On the 10th of February, 1675 came the Indians with great number upon Lancaster. Their first coming was about sunrising. So first thing in the morning, hearing the noise of some guns, we looked out, pause, guns. Who has the guns? The natives now have guns. Why would they have guns? Cheeky? Ah, trade. Thank you. Several houses were burning and the smoke ascending into heaven. At length, they came and beset our own house and quickly it was defol Ooh, quickly it was the dolefulest day that my eyes ever saw. The house stood upon the edge of a hill. Some of the Indians got behind the hill and the others into the barn and the others behind anything that would shelter them. From which, from all which places they shot against the house, to the house, towards the house, so that the bullet seemed to fly at us like hail. And quickly they wounded one man among us and then another and then a third. About two hours, two hours they were under Indian siege all. About two hours they had been about the house before they could prevail to fire on it, to fire it, meaning they burned the house. Some in our house were fighting for their lives, others wallowing in their blood, quite literally just laying in a pool of blood, dying. The house on fire over our heads and the bloody heathen ready to knock us out on the head if we even stirred out. Then I took my children to go forth and leave the house. But as soon as we came to the door, and appeared the Indian shot so thick that the bullets rattled against the house. But out we must go, the fire increasing and coming along behind us roaring and the Indians gaping before us with their guns, spears, and hatchets ready to devour us. No sooner were we out of the house, but my brother-in-law fell down dead, where the Indians scornfully shouted and hollowed, and they were presently upon him stripping off his clothes. The bullets flying thick, one went through my side and the same through the bowels and the hand of my dear child in my arms. Y'all, she has a child in her arms, right? She's running through literally a hailstorm of bullets from the Indians. One goes through her in the side and the other just right into her child in her. And she says to specifically that through the bowels, the stomach and the hand of her child, right? That's not something you're gonna come back from, especially not at that time. Maybe now, if you get to the doctor in time, but definitely not then. So we can now picture her carrying her dead child in her arms or dying child. Yet the Lord by his almighty power preserved a number of us from death. For there were 24 of us taken alive and carried captive. 24 made it through this and they're carried into captivity, meaning they're going straight to the Indian houses, um, wigwams, camp, and they're gonna live there as slaves. But now I must turn my back upon the town and travel with them into the vast desolate wilderness. I know not whither, I don't know where we're going. It was not my tongue or pen can express 
the sorrows of my heart and bitterness of my spirit that I had at this departure. But God was with me in a wonderful manner. One of the Indians carried my poor wounded babe upon the horse and it went moaning all along. I shall die, I shall die. I went on foot after it with sorrow that cannot be expressed. My sweet babe, like a lamb, departed this life on February 18th, 1665, which they correct 1667. It being about six years and five months old, her six-year-old child killed by the Indians, nine days from the first wounding in this miserable condition without any refreshing from one nature or another except a little cold water, nine days this six-year-old child suffered at the hands of the Indians. Nothing was given to it to comfort the child. She held her dying child, y'all for nine days. That is the love of a mother. And that's the love your mother and father have for you as well, right? This is deep, hard stuff to read <clears throat> and picture. Um, I cannot but take notice how at another time I could not bear to be in the room where a dead person was, but now this case has changed. I must and I could lie down by my dead babe side by side all the night after. She couldn't even leave her child. She was so heartbroken and she comforted it. <clears throat> all right, the first week of my being among them, I hardly ate anything. The second week I found my stomach grow very faint for want of something and yet was very hard to down their filthy trash. But the third week, though I could think of how formerly my stomach would turn against this or that, I could now starve and die before I could eat such things and yet, now all of a sudden they were pleasant and savory to my taste. I was at this time knitting a pair of white cotton stockings for my mistress, mistress, pause, pause, pause. Okay, <clears throat> so she's just suffered the death of a child. She has been on starvation's doorstep, death's doorstep for almost three weeks. Now she's actually starting to eat. And then we get this picture of her just sitting beside her mistress, her slave owner, right? the Indian woman who, or the native woman who is now in charge of her. And she's just knitting a pair of socks. I don't know if any of y'all knit. My grandmother tried to teach me uh, knitting and crocheting when I was younger. And I don't think I could really remember it now. Maybe I could watch a YouTube video, whatever. But it's a very slow, steady, tedious process. You would just sit, wrap, switch. And eventually it would grow, right? So you have to just imagine her sitting there quite bored, but wallowing in her mind of all of the pain and suffering that she's just seen. Am I even going to get home? This lady beside me is in charge of me. Like she's got a lot going through her mind. So knitting actually probably is a really good way to think things through, but just picture that picture her sitting there. And I was at this time knitting a pair of white cotton socks for a mistress. And I had yet, yet that, and I had not yet wrought upon the Sabbath day. When the Sabbath came, they bade me to go to work and I told them it was the Sabbath day and desired to let them to let me rest. And I told them I would do much more tomorrow to which they answered me, they would break my face. Okay, so pause. I do find that funny, slightly break my face. We still use that sometimes today, right? But here she is saying, it's the Sabbath, I'm supposed to rest. My conscience tells me to rest. And she's like, y'all, you know, it's the Sabbath. I've got to rest. I'll do much more work tomorrow. I promise, right? Um, what would she have been again, by the way, if she was in Massachusetts? Y'all remember? Descendant of a pilgrim, so a separatist. She could have been a Puritan who moved further inward. Um, either way, a Bible-believing Christian, right, who took very carefully and clearly what the Sabbath was and resting. And here she is in her slavery and to a native trying to um, rest. And they're like, no, you're funny. Work or we're just gonna break your face. And they quite literally probably would have broken her face. Um, let's go ahead and finish this. So during my abode in this place, Philip, the king, King Philip, he's the head Indian, the head native. Um, again, we'll get into a little bit more detail about this in chapter four or five, I believe it is. Or did y'all already read it? Now I'm really confused. Um, yeah. Okay, you read about King Philip's war. 
No, you read about pay quads for. Anyways, I, we talk about it somewhere else a little bit more. It's fine. Um, or we'll talk about it when you get back. So during my abode in this place, Philip spake to me to make shirts for his boy, which I did, for which he gave me a shilling. Whoa, natives have coin and guns, right? We're talking about some serious trade in between these two people groups now. I offered the money to my master, but he bade me to keep it. And with it, I bought a piece of horse flesh to eat horses. So sorry, Aubrey. Afterwards, I made a cap for his boy for which he invited me to dinner. I went and he gave me a pancake about as big as two fingers. And it was made of parched wheat, dry wheat beaten and fried in bear's grease, right? We use bacon grease, that's pig's grease to fry stuff up. They were using bear's grease. And I thought I never tasted a pleasanter meat in my life. There was a squaw who spoke to me to make a shirt for her sin up. A squaw is a female native um, for her sin up, which she gave me a piece of bear. Ooh, good tasty bear meat. Another asked me to knit a pair of stockings for which she gave me a quart of peas. I boiled my peas and bear together and invited my master and mistress to dinner. But the proud gossip, because I served them both in one dish, would eat nothing except one bit that he gave her upon the point of his knife. Okay, so a couple things here. First of all, Mrs. Rowlandson is using her knitting skills to her advantage and earning or gaining favor with the natives which means they're treating her better, they're giving her food, they're being quite um, understanding here. I mean, we know they just sab it or sacked their house and killed a bunch of people and brought them into captivity, but they're treating her as a decent human being and trading food with her work for work. Um, not all Native Americans did that. And when we get into the, the Midwest and stuff in eighth grade and those Indians were, we'll see that this sort of somewhat peaceful um, -ness of trade is not gonna be the same. So I just kinda want you to keep that in the back of your mind here. The colonial natives, though dangerous at times, there are decency still. Um, so we see this trade and then we see that she's trying to please her master again. So she boils her peas and bear together. Okay, like a shepherd's pie, cool. Uh, minus the potatoes, I guess, but not a horrible meal, meat and peas. And she gives some to her master, but she only has one dish to feed them. And we see here that the man does not feed the woman from the same dish. So this tells us something about the Native American culture, which is there's a hierarchy, right? And the Puritans, we read about them having some of a hierarchy themselves. We should not be totally surprised that the natives have one. But we should slightly be surprised that Mrs. Rowlandson hasn't figured that out yet. That she's been with them four, five, six weeks, maybe even longer now, that she hasn't figured out that the men and the women don't share food. You know, and I guess the the, the man maybe felt a little pity on Mrs. Rowlandson, so he gave a bite to the wife, because he guess he could tell she meant well. But we know that the Puritans had a hierarchy too, right? Because they might have only had one chair in their whole house and it was for the man. So this is not, uh, it's surprising, but it's not surprising if that makes sense. And, and I hope you're seeing that and I hope you're actually watching this. Um, but I guess if you're not watching it, you're not watching it. So you don't know that I just said that. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> we came that day to a great swamp by the side of which we took our dog lodging that night. When I came to the brow of the hill and looked towards the swamp, I thought we had come to the great Indian town. Though there were none but our own company, the Indians were as thick as the trees. I mean, people say it in everywhere. It seemed as if there had been a thousand hatchets going at once. If one looked before one, there was nothing but Indians, and behind one, nothing but Indians, and so on either hand. I myself in the midst, and no Christian soul near me. And yet, how hath the Lord preserved me in safety? After a restless and hungry night there, we had a wearisome time of it the next day. The swamp by which we lay, as it were, a deep dungeon, and an exceeding high and steep hill before it, I got to the top of the hill, or sorry, before I got to the top of the hill, I thought my heart and legs would have broken and failed me. What through faintness and soreness of body, it was a grievous day of travel to me. 
being got out of her, my mistress's sight, I had time and liberty again to look into my Bible, which was my guide day by day and my pillow by night. Oh, she took her Bible with her when she ran from her house. She didn't tell us this till now, but when she ran from her house, she had her Bible stored in her somewhere. Either that meant she carried it around with her all the time anyways. And so when she left, it was there. Or as she was leaving, she thought, holy cow, Lord, I can't do this without you and grabbed her Bible. I mean, can we say that? Do we literally carry our Bible with us wherever we go? Are we always looking to what the Lord has called us to do? Are we always looking back at his promises, which are yes and amen? I mean, are we? I can say that most of us probably aren't to the extent of which we would. We might get up and read a, a devotion in the morning and go about our day and woohoo, I did a devotion, right? But is our faith as deep as this woman's? I mean, this knocks me off my socks. Like, am I really trusting in the Lord when I need to be? She uses it as her pillow at night and the natives haven't taken it from her. Now that the comfort, now that comfortable scripture presented itself to me, Isaiah um, 7, for a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies I will gather thee. Thus the Lord carried me along from one time to another and made good to me this precious promise and many others. Wow, what a wonderful excerpt from her book. What a wonderful story she shares with us. I highly encourage y'all to find her book and read the entire the entire thing. It's um, It'll open your eyes to history and to your heart. So you've got to answer the questions, post your picture when you're done. That's all I have for today. So excited we actually got to kind of do something together. And I look forward to seeing y'all's faces again <clears throat> really soon, I hope. And continuing our discussion of um, early American history, because more wars are coming, which is yay, and but yay. So, bye seventh grade.